Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Just for the hell! Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend. So happy to be here. Been away a long time. I'll tell you later what happened, but first, let's talk about what's happening today on the show. Doc Martin is back. She brought us an interview with host of a podcast, So You Want to Be a Marine Biologist. The host is Kara Mazua, Muzia, excuse me, Kara, for getting your name wrong. The website is marinebio.life. This is a podcast that's all about how to become a marine biologist. Uh, and it's actually really, really good. I've been enjoying it. Listen to several episodes. So you can check that out anywhere you get podcasts. We'll get back to that in a minute. Fish Guy Josh is back with his segment, Fish Guy Meets Fish Guys. And this time, Fish Guy met a fish guy, and they yuck it up uh, and have a good time telling stories. Fish Guy's coming up later. Lawrence Gunther will be here with the Bluefish Radio PSA to help you handle your fish better. And of course, we'll have some news. But first... Here's some updates on the show. I told you in October, our contest was going to be the most unethical thing you've ever seen while fishing contest. And then I failed to record shows in October because my computer completely fell apart on me. Like it just, it stopped working. I had the blue screen of death. I lost tons of files, tons of data, and had to like regroup and get re-energized and get back with the podcast. So we're going to continue this contest for the month of November. And the contest is, you call the show, 607-378-FISH, 607-378-FISH, and you tell me the most unethical thing you've ever seen while fishing. So for example, <clears throat> you might call the show and say, hey, Clay, this is Joe from Montana, and the most unethical thing I ever saw was fishing. While fishing was a guy put a worm on a fly, he went fly fishing with a worm. Anyway, thanks, Clay. You know, that, that's the kind of message you would leave. And then we will pick a winner. Uh, last month, I picked randomly. This one I want to pick. I'm going to pick based on content. You give me a good story. I will pick you as the winner. And the winner is going to win some uh, Angle Kings from uh, Glasswater Lead-Free Lures. Angle Kings are made by uh, John King, the crappie hippie. And who's a big lead-free fishing advocate. I'll mail you a box of those. A Fish Nerds Winter Beanie that's lined with 100% skin from a fur-bearing trout. Guaranteed to keep your head warm and hide your bald spots. Uh, and some, some Fish Nerd stickers and some other swag. So lots of fun prizes coming up. Just call 607-378-FISH. Now, we have a lot of action on the Fish Nerds podcast group. And on our group, John King, the crappy hippie, likes to run polls. And because this month's poll is the, uh, or our contest is the uh, most unethical fishing thing, John King uh, started this poll. So his poll on the Fish Nerds podcast group on Facebook, if you're not there, get there now. His question was, more fishing ethics. What's the worst transgression in fishing? And so far, I'm going to give you the top 10. The, the number one biggest transgression, 19 votes, littering is the worst. And I, I, I kind of agree with that. It's, littering is awful. Uh, 15 votes to playing wildlife manager by lethally controlling species of fish. That's like catching your yellow perch and you decide this perch is not worthy of living and you toss it up on the bank. I, I hate that. Sadism acted out on a fish. I don't quite know what that means, but I say don't do it. Uh, unsafe boating, we got four votes. Uh, snagging and bedding fish. Uh, and then uh, inability to share public space. Disregarding slot restrictions. Um, I think some people clicked on every single thing. I think uh, Paul from the uh, Varmish podcast checked every single box. But I want to read some of the comments we have here under this thing. Let's see, Paul Chomo, yep, Paul clicked every every uh, every comment. Uh, let's see, oh, D uh, David Anthony, Alonzo Scheibel picked a whole ton of them. Michael Frank says, what really makes my blood boil is when someone uses illegal techniques while fishing out of season, disregarding all size and number limits. I've seen it too many times, and I once explained to a fellow fisherman holding a casting net, 
along the banks of Potomac River that if he wanted to catch herring, he could move upstream and catch as many as he wanted. The cast net was not legal, blah, blah, blah. Um, by the way, Michael Frank um, is a member of our podcast, and he does occasionally submit. But Michael, I'm calling you out now. You are one of our, our guide correspondents. Push record on your computer. And all these words you type, say them into the microphone and send them to me so we can use them for show content. Um, what else we got? Uh, Jeff Jensen, our FN library, has a real problem with bow fishers who kill tons of native fish and then dump them because they consider them trash fish. I hate, I hate the idea of trash fish so much. Um, uh, John King says, "Oh yeah, little game managers with with a bow too lazy to too oh too lazy to clean fish. Same as hunting and leaving an animal lie in the woods." Jeff says, "If you want to just slaughter stuff, there's an almost unlimited supply of common grass." Big head and silver carp in most of the rivers around here. And then Michael uh, says to Jeff, we've had a fish kill scare here in Lower Saluda a couple of years ago when one of those guys dumped his gar suckers near a ramp. Um, so yeah, be really careful. Um, but lots of people picked all of them. We have lots of fun at the Fishers Podcast uh, group. So get on the Facebook and, sit and, and join us there. It's where we talk a lot and where a lot of show content comes from. And you get to hang out with some of the uh, fish nerds friends and family so thanks for all of you guys who do participate in the fish nerds podcast group all right i'm gonna bring you one news story today so how about some news 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 fish in the news everybody loves their fish in the news and i've been sitting on this story for a long time all right so florida fisherman lost at sea for 14 days claims he was sexually assaulted by Mermaids. Uh, a fisherman lost at sea for 14 days off the coast of Florida has been rescued by the United States Coast Guard this week. This is from the WorldNewsDailyReport.com, uh, Florida's only source for good news. A fisherman, uh, see, Alvin McAllister, 72, was found on a small rocky islet 200 miles off the nearest coastline where he shipwrecked two weeks ago and managed to survive off of several seagulls, mussels, and urchins. McAllister, for whom doctors do not fear for his life, was found suffering from intense hallucinations caused, potentially, by dehydration and the toxins of unidentified mussels he consumed on the small islet. Uh, he described in graphic detail how he was forced to perform oral sex on the fish-like genitals of these aquatic creatures, not only in, onto the women, but also onto the men. McAllister's brother added in tears, visibly grateful to find his brother alive. Um, McAllister, who is believed to have ingurgurated, 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 I've no, not seen this word before, ingurgurated some of the toxins such as lead or mercury found dangerous quantities in certain varieties of mussels, he consumed is still under psychiatric evaluation. Although Mc, Mr. McAllister does not present abnormal injuries and inflammation to the genital and anal area, it's highly unlikely that he was sexually exploited or sodomized by living sea creatures. And uh, these are possibly self-inflicted <laughs> wounds, explained one medical expert. Uh, McAllister's mental state does not is, not, is presently unstable. Uh, doctors believe he should heal completely in a week or two after his body has expurgated the dangerous levels of toxins he's been exposed to. Um, I will say, if you have mercury, you're not going to expurgate anything. Now, I was reading a little bit about mermaid history and how mermaids have been part of most sea-bearing cultures for eons. And I think that that he was happy to see these guys, just like the ancient Sumerians, just like the Greeks, just like the Vikings, uh, just like Christopher Columbus himself, founder of our great country, our first president, uh, was able to decide whether he wanted to be assaulted by a mermaid. So, um, you know, if you see a mermaid, it's it's a rare opportunity. You might as well just, you, you know, if, if it's if it's welcome, it's not assault. Just let him do it, even if it's a merman, because it's such a rare treat. So that's the news today. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, how about a little PSA from Lawrence Gunther from the Bluefish Radio? I'm Lawrence Gunther, and this is another Bluefish Canada stewardship tip. Catch and release. 
harvesting fish from bodies of water close to urban areas where there's lots of fishing pressure, you know, you might want to think about maybe not taking your full limit. If you're fishing close to a big city, maybe you want to let the fish go. We all want to go fishing. We all love to catch fish and let fish go. And we all love to eat the odd fish. Let's just do it thoughtfully. For all the latest Canadian fish and fishing news, follow Bluefish Radio. All right. Thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate your uh, your insight, smartness, and you making our show just a little bit smarter than it usually is. Speaking of smart, Doc Martin's back. Doc Martin is chatting with Kara Muzuya. Muzuya from marinebio.life, host of the podcast, So You Want to Be a Marine Biologist. I'm going to let Doc Martin and Kara take it for the next, I don't know, however they want, long they want to talk. Would you just like to kind of give us a background on, you know, how did you start this? You've got, you say you got 12 episodes. Yeah, um, so actually number 12 is being released tomorrow. Um, Great, so the second, all right. Do you have a regular release schedule or... I release every other Wednesday. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It, you know what? It takes up more time than I have, had originally ever thought it would, but it's fun and it's worth it. And I've learned consistency is probably the best way to kind of keep, keep an audience that I'm getting. Um, it's how I listen to podcasts. Like if they haven't posted anything in a while, then I'm like, oh, what happened there? So their consistency is best. Every other week. How, how often sense. does the fish nerds post? Um, we're uh, sorry, Clay, but we are not consistent. <laughs> I don't think we, <laughs> we posted in uh, maybe June or July, and then I think we have we dropped two episodes in September. So we had like a little bit of a summer hiatus, um, and now now we're coming back. So that that's good at least. But yeah, we we try to do I think. At least once or twice a month. Okay. And so um, usually, especially for like me during the semester is just easier. I'm, I know I'm going to be in my office. I'm not going to be out in the field or wherever. And so just being on a regular schedule helps me be a more regular contributor. Mm-hmm. I would imagine uh, Clay is also um, in the teaching profession, he, so he works on a semester schedule. So I think just that regularity helps a lot. Yeah. And then the summer is kind of like crazy. <laughs> um, I feel like summers but, yeah. usually are. It doesn't doesn't matter what field or what it doesn't matter what you're doing. Summers is just usually like very unpredictable, which is fun. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like the weather's nice, so now it's time the time to do all the things, right? Yes. <laughs> Regardless of what, what you're doing, your job-wise, you kind of want to get all the stuff done. It's <laughs> all, true. See all the sites. Very true. So what led you to say, I should start a podcast, this crazy adventure? <laughs> it really is a crazy adventure. <laughs> so I am a marine biologist. I have gotten, I've gotten asked how to get the jobs that I've had many times. Um, and I've gotten asked while I'm working, I'm um, like, I'll be heading out to the boat with all my gear. And people are like, that's, that's awesome. Like you're going to work right now. Like, how do I do what you do? Um, I've done sea turtle work on the beach and I'll be riding the ATV down the beach, which in where I live in South Florida, you can't do unless you're a sea turtle biologist or lifeguard or a law enforcement officer. So I'm riding the ATV on the beach and people just see that glamorous side of the job and they're like, oh my gosh, how do I do that? Like, how do I get that job? Um, And then if I wear work shirts in public, people ask me, I've been to fruit stands or I've been to Chipotle. I go there a lot and I've had people just like stop me and ask me in line and I'll sit down and like eat my burrito with them and we chat marine biology and how they can become a marine biologist. So it's kind of something that's like evolved and been in the back of my head that people are interested. People really want to be marine biologists and there should be something out there that kind of helps them navigate the many different pathways that there are, or at least kind of illuminate the many different pathways there are to becoming a marine biologist. So that was the impetus behind it. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's great. So um, I'm I'm just going to interject my personal story because it has to do with marine biology. Yeah. Um, speaking of people seeing that and wanting to do it, so I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. It was I was in second grade and I was watching like some PBS documentary with my mom, and there was a, a marine biologist. That's who they were following, <laughs> and you know they're diving all over and diving with sharks and whales and turtles and all this stuff, and mm-hmm. then they say, well. I'm a marine biologist. This is what I do. And I'm like, oh, my God, I want (laughs) to do that thing. That's amazing. And so I do the freshwater version, although most people call me a marine biologist all the time. Um, It's actually happened several times when I've been interviewed for uh, newspaper articles or something. (laughs) And It's like I'm a freshwater aquatic ecologist and they still call me a marine biologist, which is fine. It's not technically the same thing. But I think you're right. Like there's just that something about being in the ocean which is such a cool place and getting to work with those really neat and unique animals that especially i'm in kansas so we don't see those every day right right (laughs) and it's just very inspiring i think and so i think you're right a lot of people are interested in it i'm also the faculty advisor for the marine biology club here on campus and so that's a lot of the questions is you know how do i become a marine biologist when i don't live near the marine Right. <laughs> right. And it's really interesting. There are a lot of people I've I've interviewed and a lot of people that I just know outside of the podcast um, are marine biologists who come from the Midwest, like people like landlocked areas. My husband actually grew up in Wisconsin and he wanted to be a marine biologist growing up. And then he was really good at math. So his parents convinced him to major in ocean engineering instead. So he's the more mechanical side and I do the living stuff. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's great. awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of how the podcast got started. There, I feel like the marine biology is a career that many people wanted. I've also had people be like, oh, I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was growing up and then I did something else instead. Or my niece wants to be a marine biologist. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's just many people that are interested in it out there. Yeah, so um, of all the people that are interested, because I think that is a lot of people, and mm-hmm. you get that same statement like, oh, I really wanted to do that, but. Mm-hmm. Do you have any indication of what that but is? Like just they didn't know how or that just wasn't an option at the school that they went to or just some weird personal thing that happened? Do you have, do you know? I, I don't know. I think I think it's probably a combination of all the things you li- just listed. It's, mm-hmm. you know, pe- people don't understand the path or sometimes the schooling itself intimidates them. You know, you have to take a lot of biology and chemistry and people don't realize that they just see people out playing with dolphins and they wanna, I want to, I want to go play with dolphins. And they don't realize that there's actually a lot, a lot of science that goes behind that degree. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I want to show on show on the podcast as well is that, you know, if you want to be a marine biologist, I'm assuming you just really love the ocean and kind of want to help the creatures or just be more in the field and more involved with it. And and one thing that you can do is you don't actually have to major in marine biology. There's many different ways to actually get involved with the ocean science without being a scientist. You can be a communicator or a photographer or an artist. There's just so many different things that you could do to help the ocean and and kind of be around it without having to take all those science classes that do intimidate a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I teach the science classes. So I, yeah, that's definitely mm-hmm. one of the bottlenecking points for students as they start to get in there and realize maybe there's a little bit more math with their science than they had mm-hmm. hoped or mm-hmm. just, just the overwhelming amount of terminology and definitions and concepts and theories and laws and all that stuff gets, can be a little intense to get through. Absolutely. Yep. I actually started my degree with th- or two of my other best friends. There's three of us starting it together. And we're like, we're all going to be marine biologists. We're all going to travel and like live in these awesome tropical places because I don't really love cold water, which I ended up <laughs> getting a job in cold water for a few <laughs> years. But but I digress. Um, so anyway, I started with the, my two best friends and I was the only one that finished. They kind of got into the science part and bailed. So, yep. yeah, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess what we should do is, uh, since you're going to be talking to the fans that don't know you, probably like just a name and what what you're really doing, like what does your research focus on and kind of how did you get to where you are? So my name is Kara Muzia. 
I live in South Florida and I have done quite a bit of different, uh, quite a few different projects in the marine bio field. Uh, when I graduated college, I actually started off uh, with the BP oil spill. So it happened the year before and they were still doing a lot of different water quality sampling and sediment sampling to see where the oil was or wasn't. <clears throat> so that was kind of my first splash into the field. And it was fantastic. I would go to work for two weeks at a time. I was on the boat all the time and taking oil, like taking water samples. And like the reasoning behind why I had to do what I had to do kind of was terrible, right? Like the Deep Horizon spill was an awful incident. But the experience that I gained from it has been really valuable throughout the rest of my career. So good with the bad, I guess. Um, my husband that I mentioned earlier, he actually got a job up in Maryland after graduating college. So I took the plunge and moved out. I'm from Florida originally and I, I left Florida and I went to, we lived in Maryland for a few years and I did, uh, oyster restoration. So the Chesapeake Bay up there is one of, was declared a, um, national disaster, essentially. It, it was like one of the most polluted bodies of water. So there was a lot of federal money that was funneled to the bay in efforts to help restore it. And the oyster populations are at 1% of historic levels. Wow. So our job, I worked for a nonprofit called Oyster Recovery Partnership. And our job was to go out and put oysters back in the bay. So we would um, work with NOAA and the state and also University of Maryland. Um, we would have, I would go out with the team. We would ground truth the site. So that requires like actually sticking my hand in the in the sand and seeing how far it goes down. Oysters like don't want to be buried. So it needs to be hard bottom. Uh-huh. And so we would go ground truth the site and make sure it was hard bottom. And then I would send a boat to go plant it. And I'm not talking like a little 25 foot boat. This is like a 50, 60 foot giant oyster barge that would drop tons of oysters, literally tons of oysters onto these spots. Um, And then we'd come back a few weeks later and check and see how it was doing. And then we'd kind of monitor each site gradually through the months or years that had passed. So that was one of the cool parts of my job. The part that I didn't love was, is it was cold, you know, Maryland has seasons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I think I four of them. <laughs> right. And I don't love seasons. So we ended up coming back to Florida. Um, but in between that, we went, we even traveled. So we actually went to South Africa and Madagascar for a few months. And while we were in Madagascar, we volunteered over there and, um, actually did coral surveys. It was coral, fish IDs, and um, yeah, there's coral and fish IDs. And kind of, we learned a lot. I didn't, I didn't really know any Indo-Pacific fish and I had to learn a bunch in order to be able to do it. Um, but it was amazing. You know, it was a couple months of just literally putting on your dive tank and walking out to one of the most pristine coral reefs that I'd ever seen and doing surveys. So that was a lot of fun. And then I came back to Florida and I had done some sea turtle work in college and I called up some old friends and they were like, yeah, we're actually hiring. It's a really busy nesting season. Like, come on. So I've kind of been in the sea turtle world since. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's see. I guess one of the one of the cool things that we do is there's the I don't know if you know the sea turtle Inc. maybe on San Padre Island in Texas. I've seen them. I've seen them on the socials. Yeah. So um, our marine biology club goes there to do sea turtle work every um, spring break. Very cool. What do you guys do? Um, I actually never get to go. <laughs> My students oh, no. go and I stay here and do work. <laughs> so of um, the students, they do all the fundraising and they get everything done and they go down there. And then uh, the scientists and staff there uh, take care of them and teach them everything that they need to do. I've, I've never been, so I have no idea exactly what they do. But it's a lot of, um, I think, nest locations and watching hatchlings and just doing general uh, beach cleanup and just that kind of t- typical survey more or less kind of stuff. Cool. And the students cool. really like it. <laughs> yeah, that's really early in the nesting season. That's cool. Yep. So, 
unfortunately, that's as close as I've ever been to doing sea turtle work. <laughs> well, you should go down one year. I, I should, um, you know, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, so when I, of course, when I wanted to be a, a scientist, at first I really wanted to be a research scientist. I wanted to be out doing the stuff and I didn't want to teach. And then I was forced to teach um, at the graduate school I went to, you have to, even if you're an RA, you, you must teach a course. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it turns out I love teaching a lot, mm -hmm. but that also means that I am in the classroom and in the building a mm -hmm. lot more than in the field. So, mm -hmm. which is okay. I'm going out actually, after I get off with this conversation, I'm taking some students out to the freshwater streams. We're going to go get some darters. So very cool. Every once in a while, I still get out there, but, um, okay. I'm I digress. <laughs> um, so in your experience, it sounds like you, from the, the things I've read online without actually listening to your podcast, mm -hmm. I, I read your, um, your website that you sent and the email that you sent to me. Um, so you do interview, um, other professionals and they talk about their stories. Is that kind of the yeah. gist? Yes. So the gist of the podcast, um, I've done a couple episodes of just me recording, um, I've, I've broken down some scientific jargon that gets thrown down a lot that people okay. may or may not understand. Um, and I've also done an episode about just stories from the field. Some stories are my own from the field and some are other people's. But I just think that there's so much to learn from stories, whether it's like mistakes or things that you may want, may be interested in. Um, one of my questions that I ask everybody that's on the podcast is, what's your favorite field story to tell? Um, and sometimes I get like, oh, this is the worst day. Here we go. Or I get like, oh, like the most amazing thing happened. I had the best breakthrough. So it's just it's really fun to hear different perspectives and you learn a lot from it. But so and I've only done a couple episodes of me talking because I don't know. I think other people have very interesting, interesting things to say. And I would like to put that out into the world. Um, and they kind of show the best way to become a marine biologist, which is really to stay curious and take action and just find your own path. Um, Cause I don't think I've talked to anybody who has had the exact same story. I know I haven't, whether it's on the podcast or in my real life, I haven't talked to anybody that's like, we did these exact same things and we have different careers or we have the same career. Nobody, everybody has a different way of navigating the marine bio world and there's better ways to do it. And so I guess, um, obviously you have an entire podcast dedicated to, so you want to be a marine biologist. Um, mm -hmm. is there anything like some cliff notes version that you might want to share with our fish nerds fans that maybe they're interested in, you know, just learning more about being a marine biologist, learning more about kind of the different pathways to get there that might sure. be useful. Sure. So, if you want to actually be a marine biologist, probably the universal pathway is you need to get a degree. But if you don't want to get a degree or you're not sure about go spending you know, lots of time and money to get that degree, um, I actually have a free downloadable PDF called Seven Steps to Be a Marine Biologist Without a Degree. And I'll give you the Campbell Soup version right now. I won't go through all the steps. Awesome. But one, one of the main things that I advocate for people to do is to get involved. So whether that's volunteering at a local nature center and if, whether you're landlocked or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think volunteering a local nature center kind of starts to open the door to the science world and also starts to make those connections. So volunteer there, or if there really isn't anything around you, which I have a hard time believing, I think everywhere has some, some sort of nature, something happening. Um, create your own projects. So citizen science is something that's kind of been coming up and coming more and more. And it's something that's really valuable because science doesn't always have the most funding, um, as you probably know <laughs> as a professor. Uh, and so it's really valuable to be able to collect data without paying gobs of money for it. And citizen scientists is a way to do that. Um, so for an example of that, down here in Florida, we, there's a coral reef monitoring citizen science program. So you get trained and then you can go out on a regular dive and go. And if you see corals, you would report that um, and you would report the health that they're in. So coral bleaching is something that's happening right, right now. <clears throat> and so it's a way for the state to collect data on that without 
spending a lot of time and resources that they just don't have. Um, if there's something that interests you, though, doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't again, it doesn't have to be marine related. If there's something in your own backyard that interests you, you can create a project out of it. And it's just something that kind of gets the, the wheels in motion to start thinking a little bit more scientifically or even conservation wise. Like if there's something in your community that you don't agree with or you don't like that, that you think that you can do something about or start to take the steps to do something about like these are absolutely things that will help you later on in your career, whether you're a marine biologist or not. Yeah, like, yeah, citizen science is absolutely up and coming and it is awesome. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the iNaturalist app. That's a that's a huge and wildly successful citizen science um, effort there. And uh, it's also super cool. So if you if the fans out there listening have not downloaded iNaturalist, highly recommend it. It's a great segue into some really basics of citizen science. Um, but it's also true that there is something wherever you are. I mean, Kansas, it doesn't have a lot going on, but there's lots of nature centers. Mm -hmm. There are things going on within the state all over that you can absolutely get involved in. So, I mean, you know, I'm not East Coast or anything like that, but there's stuff here. There's got to be stuff everywhere. It's right. just knowing where to look. Mm -hmm. And Google or your favorite search engine is a great resource for finding things. Yep. Yeah. Or even a, a, well, obviously I'm a little biased here, but a local university, like right. part of my job is to work with landowners or different institutions or whatever. And so I have an idea of what's going on in the state and who's doing what kinds of projects and what kind of help is useful or volunteer opportunities. And so just contacting someone, call up the biology office and say, do you have anyone that works in fishery stuff? <laughs> and right. They can usually tell you who that is. And then that person, if normally in my experience, will contact you back within 14 business days, <laughs> which I wish it was faster, but I get so many emails. <laughs> I bet. But yeah, that's great. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can start building the resume before you even need to. And then you start making connections and it just, you never know where, where experiences can take you. It's important to start having them. <laughs> Stay yes. curious. Experiences are fun in and of themselves, but then they lead you to something even more fun. Absolutely. <laughs> well, great. Um, so I I do, and if you wanted to add anything, or so I'm going to segue into some of my student questions and statements. Let's do it. Student okay. questions. Okay. So um, I have the Marine Biology Club here at ESU. It's it's new, so we didn't have one for a long time, and then. Um, Four years ago, five years ago, four or five years ago, um, I had a group of students come to me and say, hey, we really like marine biology. We want to start a club. Will you be the faculty advisor? I said, sure, because this is my for also my first year being a faculty member. So I was like, I'll do that. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> um, and it's been really great so far. Um, the students themselves have been they, they take care of everything. I don't have to do anything except sign papers. And it's just incredible. Um I don't think that I was ever that motivated in any of the clubs I was in as an undergraduate. <laughs> um, and so some of the things that they ask me about um, are what kind of skills are helpful to be a marine biologist, like just really fundamental skills that they can have that will help them in their career. So a couple things kind of popped into my head. Um, one of them, diving. Just because you're a marine biologist doesn't mean that you're going to dive, but there are a lot of jobs out there that want that skill on the resume just in case. Um, and that and that's true for even people that are maybe in, in the lab. Um, bigger organizations may have two branches, a lab and like a more field related. But if you're able to kind of be do all the things, um, it, it helps. So diving is definitely a big one. I've seen lots and lots of jobs that have diving as a requ not required or recommended mm -hmm. um, skill to have. Um, common sense. <laughs> it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds really silly to say, right? But being able to kind of like think on your feet and apply common sense to a situation is really important, especially if you want to be on the field. Uh, things happen. Best laid plans don't matter um, when nature's involved. Nature just yep. giggles and does what she wants anyway. 
So being able to kind of think on your feet and stay calm and use a lot of common sense helps. Um, and if you are one to kind of um, to get a little anxiety in certain situations, maybe try to put yourself out there a little bit more and to kind of to be able to use the common sense or just be able to work yourself through a situation because it, it does happen and you just have to be able to stay calm. Um, and then the third thing that kind of popped in my head and my friend Jess actually was the one that gave me this and it's gold. If you want to be in the field, some like actual mechanic skills would are worth their weight in uh, not even gold. And what's more valuable than gold? Platinum? Is platinum more valuable? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, some mechanic skills. Mechanics are expensive and boats break. It's a law. Um, boats actually stand for break out another thousand, if anybody didn't know that. And and to have somebody that is like, oh, hold on, I got this. It's just this. And let me switch out a couple things. We just need to order this one little part versus, oh, no, I don't know what's wrong. And we need to take it to the shop. Now you're losing a day on the water. Now you're losing hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Being able to have some mechanical skills is huge. Yeah, I, I, those are three absolutely perfect examples, and I, I can vouch for all three of them. Those are absolutely <laughs> fantastic things. When I look for students to work in my lab, those are the things that I also look for. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. Great, great. Um, I was wondering, if, so if you're going out and you're going to be some some variety of marine biologist, mm -hmm. um, what kind of equipment do you tend to use regularly? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> In general, I know there's a lot. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're doing. Um, probably across the, like I, like I mentioned, I've done a lot of pr different projects, um, seagrass surveys, oyster restoration, sea turtle research. Uh, probably the most universal thing that I've used is a GPS. Um, any field research requires a GPS. Um, the lab work is probably the only thing that I haven't used GPS in for obvious reasons. You always but, you know, know where the lab is. <laughs> right. You know where the lab is. <laughs> I mean, maybe the first time navigating to the lab, I used my like phone's GPS. Um, but other than that, in the field, you use a GPS, whether you're on the boat navigating to the site or if you're out um, marking sea turtle nests, you use a GPS to actually physically mark the nest. Um, or not physically, digitally mark the nest with the GPS. So yeah, GPS is probably the most universal tool I've used and I've used little handheld Garmin's that are like a hundred bucks and I've used the boat GPS's and I've used the really $25,000 expensive Trimble GPS's. So GPS is probably the most consistent. Um, I've dove a lot. So all your dive gear is something that I've used. Um, I haven't, a, mo hmm, a couple of my jobs have provided dive gear most of my job and, and a couple of them I had to bring my own stuff. Um, and then field clothes. I guess that's the other big one. GPS and field clothes. I'll say that. So what are, what are on, field clothes? Right. So <laughs> early on, I invested in a wardrobe. It was like, you know, five shirts, five pants, maybe more. Um, and it, I, I use Columbia or Magellan because I was in the Gulf at the time and that was there. Just the long sleeve, breathable shirts. And this is, you know, I was working in hot places. So when you're not in hot places, you obviously want to have like sweatshirts and stuff like that. But um, breathable shirts and then pants that are kind of the swishy, quick dry pants. Um, and then a really big wide brim hat and a buff, which is that like neckerchief looking thing that goes around your face. But it's really light material and you can still breathe through it. Because if you're out in the sun you don't want to, you don't want to go home with a sunburn because chances are you're going to go out the next day. Um, and then you add a sunburn on top of a sunburn, which isn't fun. Mm -hmm. And it actually helps keep you cooler being out in the field with the clothes on. If they're well ventilated, you actually get some air movement through there and then you don't have the sun beating on your skin. So GPS and field clothes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then just the last question. So if maybe you're a student that's uh, or, or individual, you don't have to be a student, that's just undecided, and you say, maybe marine biology is interesting, and maybe not, I don't really know. Um, how would you sell marine biology to that student, or person? Ooh! <laughs> how would I sell it? Let's see. If you want a career 
that it that will always keep you on your toes, that will give you something different pretty much every day, even if you think you're doing the same thing. And that can take you all over the world if you let it, then marine biology is for you. And you also get a chance to help save the planet. So look at that. That's pretty cool. That's my very short <laughs> self. <laughs> I like it. So um, I guess my the last last question from students and from a student perspective is, are you satisfied with your job and career choice? I am. You know what? I've had a lot of really cool experiences and I continue to. And I've met a lot of amazing people. Marine biology, I think science in general, probably, but marine biology definitely has some really awesome people in it. And your coworkers are always really fun to go hang out with after work, too. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I'm, so, I'm very happy with my choice. Awesome. Um, are there any other things you'd like to talk about that I haven't covered already or any other last minute wisdom pieces? I feel like we covered quite a bit. I mean, if marine biology is something you're even remotely interested in, go for it. Ch volunteer, find an internship, just try to put yourself out there and really see if it's something that you want to do. There's plenty of opportunities to just test the waters without jumping full tilt in. Uh -huh. um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, test the waters. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't have to be a, I will do this or I will not. You can test things and see if they fit for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And for all the fans out there, you should have a go. You should go have a listen to So You Want to Be a Marine Biologist podcast. And is there anywhere <laughs> else where they can find information on you or the podcast? Yes. Uh, the podcast is also over at marinebio.life. It was a little bit shorter than So You Want to Be a Marine Biologist. <laughs> And are you so on if, Apple Podcasts or? I'm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your favorite podcast player. We are everywhere. So definitely check out the podcast and head on over to the website. I have a newsletter if you'd like to subscribe and hear more about marine biology and the marine biology world. Um, and I'll keep you up to date on the podcast as well. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> it was good to virtually meet you, Erica. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, Kara. Uh, again, you could check out Kara's website at marinebio.life. If you have any interest in all in becoming a marine biologist, this is the this is the show for you. Fish guy meets fish guys. Fish guy. Fish guy. Fish guy meets fish guys. Fish guy, fish guy, Josh. All right, fish nerds, we are here on a trek to the San Diego airport because uh, I just completed Comic Con, uh, something I do every year, and I did it with my good buddy Travis here, and we thought it would be a good idea to record a new fish guy meets fish guy segment on our way to the airport because my buddy Travis here is one of the managers for a koi pond company and he leads a pretty interesting job. I used to do the job myself. We, we worked together for a little while too before I moved and um, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens to pond guys. So Travis, tell me a little bit about what you do at the company, tell me about the company, kind of a day-to-day -day of, of life and times of a pond guy. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Travis. I'm the service manager for California Aquatics. I run the crew of service guys. that We work like pool guys, but uh, for the most part, we take care of fish ponds and uh, decorative water features and fountains. Uh, so we're all over San Diego County. We're, uh, it's a pretty time-consuming job, but it's pretty fun. I get to go all over the place basically working like a pool guy and uh, I get instead of uh, you know pools it's just taking care of fish ponds where we clean the filters, maintain the biological balance, clean the traps, clean the uh, you know the, the trim the plants back, do all the basics that uh, need to be done to keep a koi pond looking good. I like to tell my customers that the, uh, the fish pond is the animal's toilet. Well I'm the guy that flushes the toilet basically. <laughs> All right. Um, 
we're going to dive right into Tales of the Pond Guy, some of Travis's best stories of working all those years on the job at California Aquatics. So, Travis, let's start off with the craziest experience you've ever had working as a pond guy. Okay, so uh, craziest. There's this happened, happened actually at the beginning of this year. Um, so we... Like I said, it's not just, I am a pond guy, but I'm also a pool guy in a, in a manner of speaking in that we take care of decorative water features. This one in particular was a giant decorative fountain in front of a hospital. So it has a diatomaceous earth filter, which just look that up if you need to know what that is. It's, it's a basic pool filter, not really suited for these uh, types of applications. They're meant more for swimming pools. But uh, regardless, diatomaceous earth filter is in there and uh, the fountain is really low on water when I roll up to it, and I know that it doesn't have an automatic fill valve, so I go down into the equipment vault, and I see the valve that is for the fill line on the filter. I open the valve, and the water should immediately start ejecting back into the filter return line. Yeah. It does not because somebody that's not me because this mind you this was a saturday when i was covering for somebody else so i'm not completely <laughs> familiar with the workings of this particular vault because they're like snowflakes they, everybody builds them differently so you got to learn the exact particulars of every single system that yeah. you work with this one i was unfamiliar with but one assumes and you know what happens when you assume that <laughs> when you open a fill valve that the water should flow freely into the pool of water it did not it flowed into the filter return line, which was shut. Not being familiar with the system, I didn't see the valve was closed. Add that to the fact that the water pressure is coming right off the main line for the property. It is a lot of water pressure going right to a closed valve. The weakest point in that whole line where the pressure was building up was the filter I was standing right in front of. I saw the pressure gauge, red line to the other side, and water started spraying out of the seams where you open it up to clean the filter. As soon as I reached for the valve to close it saying, oh shit, <laughs> the gosh darn filter just explodes on my face. So thankfully my eyes were closed and my head was turned away just in time for this fiberglass filter to completely explode and water to fly everywhere. So not only did it get pelted with bits of fiberglass and filthy filter water, a huge chunk of the filter <laughs> flies up to the ceiling, breaks the, the pipe that the water's coming into the vault with. Now, there's no shutoff for this. So the you're, valve, you're I was, saying it broke the main line? <laughs> the main line coming out of the wall, feeding the valve that I opened, is broken. I go to close the valve, it does nothing because it's on the other side of it. I'm like, oh no. I follow the pipe out of the vault. I climb to the top. Look at the box where the valve should be. The valve is metal and long since rusted and gone. <laughs> it's Saturday. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know where the main line shutoff is. There's over 120 pounds of pressure filling up an underground vault with no drainage. <laughs> the pumps are going underwater now. This was like ultimate panic mode. I called my guy, thankfully he picked up the phone, directed me to the right guy to call. We called the guy that was on site, but this was like every few seconds, there's a drain in the floor that might be taking 20 gallons a minute. This thing was pumping at least 120 gallons a minute. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Thankfully, only the filter motor went underwater. The big expensive feature pumps were saved. Everything worked out in the end. All we had to do was replace the filter, but craziest freaking moment. <laughs> and very recent too. That's surprising. Yeah. You never that that proves you never know what's going to happen it on your like job. A game of Russian roulette. I was. It turns out when I talked to the guys after the whole thing was over, this guy went down the vault, turned the water on to fill the fountain. It didn't fill, so he turned it off. The next guy who didn't talk to that guy did it. The third guy did the exact same thing. I was the fourth <laughs> guy in line to open that valve to try and fill it without with no without knowing that the fill line was isolated and the filter yeah. would explode. I was the one that pulled the trigger on the bullet and had the thing explode in my face. <laughs> uh, yeah, good times. <laughs> yeah, Covered in filter filth. Uh. All right, so that was the craziest experience. Uh, because I worked this job, I know that there can be some pretty gross aspects of it. 
So my next Tales for the Pond guy, um, I would like to hear your grossest experience ever on the job. Oh, uh, grossest. <laughs> if you had to smell some of the things I smell. Oh, man. Uh, okay. This will fall under the, boy, I don't like you as a customer category and the gross category. There's a pond I take care of, and I use the word pond lightly because it's more like a lake filled by a series of ponds. It's man-made, so it collects a lot of filth down in the bottom. And uh, one of the ways we keep things pretty and keep it biologically balanced is by using these vacuum pumps to vacuum the organic sludge buildup out of the bottom. Flushing the toilet, as you were, helps keep the whole system in check. Uh, so this one particular customer and her absolutely must be pristine lawn will only allow me to eject the, uh, the filth from her lakeside fish pond in this one particular area of the lawn. That's not good enough. Normally we can put it down the sewer or put it to ground where it becomes a great fertilizer for their lawn. She wants this stuff picked up and gotten rid of. So, so typically you have a big diaphragm pump and you're pumping the sludge out of a pond, but then like you said, it's just a sewer or some sort of drainage area that this this can go to. Right, like it has the, 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 the wastewater laws. If it goes to the ocean, you get a really big fine. So we always try to do it to the letter of the law. You put it into the sewer, you put it to ground. It does not go in the street, it does not go in the storm drain. We don't need to play that game. Okay. So, but this lady, like while we, we're not putting it in the street, we're putting it on part of her lawn, but we have to pick it up. The first time I tried picking it up, I was in there bare hand picking up pond sludge, trying to put it into a flipping <laughs> trash can and like carry it across our property to put it in the dumpster. Being like, what the heck? I'm literally like getting wrist deep in caca to like make this lady's lawn look better. Eventually, I figured out a better way to do it is that you let it dry for over a week so it'll be a lot easier and more lightweight yeah. to pick up. And I got a shovel and some gloves, so well, that was, I didn't have to go through that. That's why you're the boss. You, you, you've you learned to evolve and change your technique when it goes terribly wrong, huh? Totally. I, when I get a new guy for training, I always bring him to that account and shoveling the sludge at that account and walking it across the, <laughs> the that, that property uphill for a better part of the way. That's the new guy breaker. <laughs> That's if, your test? If, if you can <laughs> do that and, like, if you can make that property look good, you can handle anything we take care of. If you can deal with that particular customer, you can handle any customer. That's, like, the boot camp job. I've broken new guys at that account. I've been broken at that account, yet I persevered. Uh. <laughs> Oh God, it's so funny. <laughs> you gotta like see his face to see the the sincerity of what he's saying to me right now. <laughs> All right. So our third question on Tales from the Pond Guy. Uh, let's hear. You kind of touched on this on your last story. Let's hear most difficult customer to deal with. Obviously, names have been changed to protect the the innocent. Um, so yeah, let let's hear. Worst customer ever. Okay, that's really easy. <laughs> oh my goodness, do I have stories? <laughs> okay, I will not mention any names, but uh, this guy's uh, this guy's an experience. Um, <laughs> okay, so this uh, we we uh, we have two sides to our company. We are a both a construction and a service company. Uh, my buddy Rick runs construction where we build the things from the ground up. I'm the service manager where we maintain the things after they're built. So Rick and his guys built a thing a while back and I got this, I was the sur lead service technician at the time and I got stuck with that job when we took this account as a new service account. So I'd been doing it for over a month before I met the customer. I was in my routine, making everything look good, had got found out where all the hookups were and what, what needed to be done, like gotten everything going. And one day I'm leaving, I don't know this guy, I've never met him before, as I'm like go, driving at a slow pace because this is a, a really, really nice house out in one of the really rich neighborhoods. So I don't want to tear up his driveway. I'm driving at a really slow pace with my, you know, my stereo down. That's why I can hear when he runs out his house, Hey, GD! 
trying to clean the language of it. <laughs> what the F word are you doing on my effing property? Who the F are you? And I'm like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> and I stop the truck. I get out. I go to introduce myself. And he says, I know Jim Dorsey. That's my boss. And I know the blah, blah, blah. And I know blah, blah, blah. But I don't know who the F you are. Who the F? Do you do and what are you effing doing on my effing property? And this is the introduction I have to this man. <laughs> Blew me a freaking way. It took everything I had to like try and center myself and be the Zen master of customer service. Like I wanted so badly to just break the dude's jaw. I'm so enraged. <laughs> <laughs> but like I had to like bring that energy inside and like channel it into a more defensive manner and like customer service voice swallow the venom swallow the venom <laughs> as it were and like channel it out as like positive energy and like he was coming at me he's like who the F are you I'm like you know I, I countered with I'm Travis I'm your pawn guy I've been doing this for a month now he's like oh okay so you work for Jim yes I work for Jim like he was giving me questions. What do you do about blah, blah, blah? Well, I blah, blah, blah. You know, I trim the plants. See that right there? <laughs> he was I netted all this you. stuff. Dude, he was grilling me about who the F I am and what the F I was doing on his property. And I was like, oh, you're giving me questions about what I'm doing? I'm giving you straightforward facts and honesty. Like, I do this. My name's this. I show up at this time, at this week, because I do it after this. Like, he was coming at me, and I had to stay on my freaking ground against him. Like, he was punching, and I had to block and parry and step out of the way. Uh, I mean, at the end of it, he calls my boss and says, I like this guy. He's a straight shooter, and he's really honest. And at that point, you're like, oh, no, he likes me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the introduction of this guy. It's, we've had him for years, and he's a, he's a real uh, uh, challenge to, to, to deal with, <laughs> let me tell you. What's been uh, some of your most memorable experiences with him? Oh, God. You mean this guy in particular? Yeah. Oh, I mean, just like little things. It's, it's more not exactly like that was like the hugest one for me because once like I got in good with him and showed him I'm there to do work at this time of the week, like I show up every week around the same time. Yeah. I put out the same amount of effort. When he says, Travis, this looks bad. I need you to take care of this. I say, yes, sir. I take care of this. And he yeah. sees that I go there and do the work. Dude, we like leveled out and everything's cool between copacetic between him and I. Everybody else in the company though. <laughs> I've heard him on the phone talking to our office lady like she's a complete doyo. And he's always got this aggro like I want it done yesterday kind of demeanor to him. So, yeah. you know, he's he's um he's he's a challenge. He's he's not a bad guy, but working for him is challenging. Yeah, I get that. I I've, I've met people like that. All right, so that'll about wrap it up for... Oh, by the way, where are we going? Um, I missed the turn, I think, while I was talking. Yeah, I saw you get in the airport lane and then get out, and I was like, is he going some other way? Oh, I'm going to take you to Harbor and then go north. Oh, okay. All right, so that'll about do it for Tales of the Pond Guy. Uh, I'd like to thank Travis for doing the interview today and, um, you know, being the pond guy and living that life. Yeah, sorry if I got a little enthusiastic sometimes. I wasn't trying to preach. It was just these. The, you asked for the you asked for the stories that that hit an emotional uh, curve. I think. Oh, they were great. They were they were absolutely perfect. Thanks so much for uh, doing the interview. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think we're gonna near the airport here, and I'll get dropped off so I can fly back home. Uh, Comic Con was a blast as always, Travis. And uh, the stories were great. And uh, to all the fish nerds, I'll see you next time around. Fish guy meets fish guys, fish guy, fish guy, fish guy meets fish guys, fish guy, fish guy, Josh. All right, so that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Big thanks to Kara Mazuya, Marine Bio Dot Life. Uh, so you want to be a marine biologist. Doc Martin, Fish Guy Josh, Wally Pleasant for our theme song, Diana's Bath Salts for our fish news, and until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early, spawn often. Never trust a, never trust a free lunch with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. Thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, hopefully we're back on track now. So 
Hey, luck. Next week, we'll have another show. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean, casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fried in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.